Okay, I think uh, we have a uh, decent number of participants. So I just will start now. Uh, first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking your time out to uh, make it to the webinar today. Uh, we already had a first session on uh, uh, the general themes of ODR and the limits and capabilities of online dispute resolution, especially given the current uh, COVID situation. In uh, this session, given that we are moving to a more digitized world where we're moving more things online and uh, firms and companies and large corporates are moving online, uh, we come to the very relevant question of what happens to data protection, what happens to say issues of confidentiality when there's an arbitration and uh, so on. So we have a stellar lineup of speakers. I will quickly introduce them and we can get into the session itself. Uh, let me start with first with Mr. Steven Finizio. Uh, Mr. Finizio is a partner in Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Dodd LLP. It's quite mouthful. Uh, he's acted as counsel and arbitrator in commercial and treaty arbitrations in uh, matters involving the laws of various jurisdictions across Europe, Asia, Africa, and the US. He's da drafted arbitration legislations and was even a counsel in the first freedom of expression case in the African court on human and people's rights. He's published extensively. Some of his publications include a practical guide to international commercial arbitration, assessment, planning, and strategy, and international commercial arbitration, generally dealing with the law of transactional uh, business transactions. He's also recognized by the Chamber's Legal 500 and Who's Who in International Arbitration, among others. Mr. Finizio is also a member of the LCI Court and is on the panel of arbitrators at a number of arbitral institutions. He teaches international arbitration as an adjunct professor and is also on the faculty of various international dispute resolution academies in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Thank you so much for taking out the time to be here, Mr. Finizio. It's a pleasure to have you on the panel. Uh, Mr. Shivam Singh uh, is our second panelist. He read law at the NLS Bangalore. He's a distinguished academic. He's finished his master's in Columbia Law School. He also did a research fellowship in the Harvard Law School. He works with Chamber 20A and is currently a litigator practicing uh, extensively at the Supreme Court of India and various high courts. His work focuses on constitutional law, criminal law, and civil commercial litigation. Our third panelist and the moderator is Mr. Ajar Rab. He is a partner at Robin Rab Associates LLP, uh, Dehradun. He is an international arbitrator and a visiting professor at the National Law School of India University, Bangalore. And, uh, and the NUJS Kolkata. He's currently pursuing his doctorate in international commercial arbitration from the Bucerius Law School, Germany. Mr. Rab has also authored a book on real estate law and his work on commercial law and arbitration is published regularly in various reputed national and international journals. Uh, finally, uh, replacing uh, Ms. Jane Rahman, who had to unfortunately step out owing to certain health issues, which uh, cropped up today. Uh, is Mr. Vikas Mahendra. Uh, he's be really thankful uh, to him for uh, coming in at such a last minute notice. And uh, it was extremely gracious of him to uh, even dedicate his Sunday to the panel. Mr. Vikas is a specialist arbitration practitioner and is a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. He has experience in handling investment treaty and commercial arbitrations in India, Southeast Asia, Central Africa, Central America, Africa, Europe, and UK and conducted under various institutional rules of arbitration and also domestic arbitrations under the Indian Arbitration Conciliation Act. He has also been selected by SIAC to be part of the Reserve Panel of Arbitrators and the HKIC to be part of their list of arbitrators. He is among the handful of arbitration practitioners from India who were chosen by the ICC to be trained as an arbitrator as part of their Advanced Arbitration Academy for India. He regularly teaches a court course on international commercial arbitration at NLS Bangalore and is widely published in popular legal journals. So that's your panel for today. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all the panelists once again for taking the time out to uh, make it here. I will hand over the floor to uh, Mr. Ajur for taking the discussion forward. All right. Thank you, Vignesh. Uh, thank you, Steve, Vikas and Shivam uh, for joining us on a Sunday. So broadly, I think everyone who's here understands the topic data security and confidentiality. Uh, there are two sides, two aspects that people have been now discussing, especially in this 
uh, pandemic. Uh, some people refer to these webinars as the pandemic. Uh, some people refer to coronavirus as the pandemic. But here we all are discussing it over a webinar. And I think we will certainly not make it uh, a torture for anybody. Uh, there, are, there were issues in data protection even before the pandemic came. Tribunals were moving online. Documents were being sent over email. They were being uploaded to cloud drives. Tribunals across jurisdiction, at least the case management conference used to happen over uh, technology such as Skype, Microsoft Teams, uh, the latest advent as Zoom. And, and now the, the bigger question, and I think that people, at least in the academic community and the practitioners community around the world are starting to ask is, what about data protection? If you're working from home, how do you make sure that there is virtual sanitization, which means that your spouse or friend in the other law firm who you share your flat with, or they are not listening into this conversation. There was an incident of a man traveling in the, in the London tube and he was apparently arguing some matter on, on video, which uh, the person uh, standing next to him recorded and broadcasted and it went viral. So there are many questions such as that. There are questions such as the uh, website of um, the hearing actually of the International Court of Arbitration being hacked uh, when there was a hearing going on. We've all these questions seem like new technology is giving was raising many questions that need answers. And I have three very wonderful gentlemen who, who might uh, will, you know, based on their experience and knowledge will try to answer them for us. So just to lay out what we'll be discussing today is the following that there are e data protection laws. There is the GDPR in the European Union, which uh, by itself has created a lot of, a lot of buzz. Vikas uh, will be telling us about what the law governing in India is. Steve will then fill us about the EU law, how, how internationally people are handling confidentiality and data protection. And Shivam will then try to answer all these questions tying in from his practical point of view about what really happens in an international arbitration and how are tribunals handling these issues. So just, I will not uh, let you wait for the, the right kind of people to advise you on this, but this is what I broadly have in mind for today's discussion. Number one is that data protection does not apply to arbitration, right? It applies to the participants in arbitration. And who do we mean by participants? We mean the lawyers, the arbitrators, the arbitral institutes that are taking part. We mean the employees, we mean the tribunal secretaries. So when you say data protection law, you are not saying data protection law applicable to arbitration. And that's, that's the question that we will deal with uh, when we get there. The second is, what about a cyber protocol? Is it something that needs to be part of the arbitration agreement? Do parties need to agree on it separately? Does that flow for inherently from the tribunal's powers to regulate the arbitration? And then there are exceptions and rules about when you can transfer data, who has to handle data. And more importantly, in respect of arbitration, does fair and equitable treatment under Article 16 of the model law include data processing? And yes, if yes, who bears the responsibility? And when you are imposing liability with respect to data protection, has the time arrived for people to take insurance, especially arbitrators and, and councils, for compliance with data protection laws. And just to tie the last question of enforcement, is data protection part of the law governing the contract? Is it part of the law governing the seat? Or is it mandatory law, which again becomes very subjective? subjective. So without much further ado, Vikas, if you could just fill us in on what the Indian position on data protection is, especially with respect to arbitration, what laws are dealing with arbitration, and then we'll we'll move from there to Steve. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ajar. I think the answer, unfortunately, is relatively simple, but probably not what people want to hear, which is that there is really no robust data protection law that governs anything in India. Now, what we have is a patchwork of legislations, nothing which is specifically tailored to arbitration itself, except maybe if you look at the, the confidentiality obligation that has now been brought about through the recent amendments, 
Except for that, there's really nothing else which provides a broad brush framework. The only thing that actually does apply at the moment is the Information Technology Act. And the Information Technology Act, obviously done for a very specific purpose, it has a very overarching reach, deals with certain discrete elements, but not, not broad brush enough for us to have adequate protection for us to you know, be, be satisfied that any aspect of arbitration, etc. is going to be covered. Now, so far as the Information Technology Act itself is concerned, Section 43A of the Information Technology Act has some basic safeguards. It says, when a body corporate possesses or deals with any sensitive personal data or information, and you know, what amounts to sensitive personal data or information is again defined in the Act and the rules, and they will include things like, you know, your personally identifiable information, your passwords, biometric data, etc., etc., some of which we do come across during the course of an arbitration particularly, you know, individually identifiable information. Um, and 43A says that if a body is negligent in maintaining a reasonable security to protect such data or information, and this causes loss, then there is a, there is an offense. There is, you know, there are damages that are payable. There is also a, a prosecution that can be done under section 72 a etc. This broad brush provision was then tried to be, you know, uh, some more meat was sought to be filled into it through the information technology, reasonable security practices and procedures and sensitive personal data or information rules. That's just a ridiculously long name, but essentially what it does is it tries to identify what they call is sensitive personal data or information as opposed to just personal data or information. And there again, you know, without going into very much of the detail, it talks about obtaining consent while uh, obtaining the information identifying the purpose for which it is sought and seeing whether the collection of the information is necessary to fulfill that purpose. Uh, then it also talks about, you know, ensuring that there is adequate transparency in the manner in which that information is used. The people who are allowed to use that information, having a grievance officer for the purposes of, you know, resolving any issues that might come up with that information, et cetera, et cetera. And it also comes up with an IS standard. So it says that if you satisfy IS, ISO, IEC 27001, then you are also you know, deemed to have satisfied the requirements of that particular act. Now, this IT Act provision, while, it, while you know, at least it's, it's, not, it's not nothing, it certainly provides some basic degree of, uh, of uh, data protection, is not enough. It's not robust enough, and which is why the need was felt to come up with a more comprehensive data protection legislation. And that led to the personal data protection bill, which is currently tabled and it is still being processed. It's not yet the act. So it is not a law that governs anything uh, currently, but people are seeing it as the future of India. And there it has some greater details of when can information be collected? What are the safeguards that need to be taken when you're taking this information? What are the obligations of the data fiduciary, et cetera, et cetera. And just the discussion of the PDP bill can take us an hour, two hours easily. So I'm not going to go into that, but that maybe I'll stop there to say is the lay of the land. There is the Arbitration Conciliation Act, which provides some element of confidentiality in the arbitration process, which inherently imposes some amount of data protection obligations on everyone who, who has the confidentiality obligation. Then there is the Information Technology Act and the rules framed under it, which provides a further layer of, of protection. Of course, not full-blown protection because it's not comprehensive enough. The PDP bill hopefully will cover most of those lacuna, but unfortunately it's still at the stage of a bill and it has not yet reached a, a legislation stage at this point now. Maybe I'll stop there and I'll see if there's any further questions later on. Thank you so much, uh, Vikas, uh, for that clear structure and, and telling us which law applies. Steve, uh, can I request you to please tell us what's happening internationally about the EU protection law, data protection laws, and how uh, countries like England or the US are dealing with these questions? Thanks, Ajara. It is, I think, important to draw some distinctions between the different types of issues we're talking about, which overlap. We have data protection regulations, as Vikas was just describing, and you've referred to the GDPR, which is the monster. I'll come back to that monster in a second. Um, there also is cybersecurity concerns that can be addressed contractually and through other mechanisms. And we have the old fashioned idea that parties also contract for confidentiality. And all this, when we're talking other than about data protection regulations, really is a form of confidentiality and how you enforce and protect yourself um, in terms of confidentiality of, of materials being used in an arbitration. 
But let me, let me come back to the GDPR, which is the general data protection regulation in Europe, and it is very comprehensive and it doesn't fit very comfortably with what we do ordinarily in arbitration. And it has a massive reach because all you need is someone involved in the arbitration or in the processing of data involved in the arbitration to touch Europe and arguably the GDPR then applies. The other reason it's a monster is that many countries are looking at the GDPR as the model for how they're drafting their own data protection regulations. And so therefore, it's not just a question of, of understanding it if you touch Europe, it's also understanding it because it's being used in other places as the model. And so the approach is being borrowed. And effectively, as you said at the beginning, it really is trying to regulate the people and it's creating rights in some ways for people, including the stakeholders that may not be obvious. If someone's name is mentioned in an email that's, that's then used in the arbitration, that person may have rights and obligations. It does try to create some room for data to be used for legitimate purposes, data that would otherwise be protected. But what it does is it creates a lot of obligations on the people who are considered the controllers of the data. And, there are, and it, this is where we haven't really figured it out yet in, in arbitration, but arguably everybody involved in the arbitration at a meaningful level, particularly the tribunal and also all the lawyers representing the parties and, protect, and, and, and probably um, in-house people at the parties are controllers. And at a minimum, if you were really going to worry about applying the GDPR, you probably need to be able to demonstrate if a regulator ever got interested that you have taken steps to protect the data being used and that that data is only being used in a limited way, that personal information has been redacted and that this has all been done thoughtfully through a process that's been documented. Um, the question of consent is a complicated one because I think the understanding is you don't need to reach out to everyone who's touched the arbitration or is touched by the arbitration. That, that third party whose name is mentioned in the email, you don't need to go and get consent at this stage. But, uh, but if the regulators ever decide to get more aggressive about enforcing it, there, there be, there's real questions about how you would apply it. That's, that's a little bit of background and, and, and to make it scary, the fines and the, and the consequences of violating the GDPR are, are also very draconian. But so how, how are people dealing with those sorts of regulations? Mostly they're ignoring them. And that's the reality at the moment on the theory that this is a private process and hopefully no one's going to, going to um, find out or, or investigate it. Um, the other issue is the fear that if you start asking for consent, you know, get witnesses to consent to use of their information, get any, any people who are mentioned, you suddenly create leverage for them to interfere with your arbitration because consent can be withdrawn at any time. So the idea is to try to hold on to the, the, the carve outs for enforcing contractual rights, for defending uh, legal claims and bringing legal claims, which don't give you full scope to do what you want, but there are some room for you to use this data. But behind that, more sophisticated lawyers and tribunals are starting to try to put in what we're going to talk about later, cybersecurity protocols that deal with how confidential data is being used as a way to create a protection so that if a regulator ever did get involved, that it would look like steps have been taken to reach agreement within the people participating in the arbitration to take reasonable good faith efforts to protect the data, particularly of people who are um, tangential and not actively participating in the arbitration. And among other things in particular, to show that personal data that has no relevance to the arbitration is being redacted and, and, not, and not shared. But it's a real big question mark. And I don't think we've wrestled with how to apply it very well yet. Um, and, and something is going to happen bad somewhere that's going to cause people to have to pay more attention. Some regulator is going to get involved. But at the moment, people are, are mostly wishing it, it didn't exist. Um, and that's, I, I hate to say it, but that's the reality. Maybe I, I stop at this point and we go on to some other questions and we, and we can come back to it. But it hasn't moved the needle on behavior quite enough yet. But I do think when we come together with cybersecurity issues that we're going to talk about, they overlap. And, and some of the things you do to put in place cybersecurity protocols may help you protect yourself from regulators.
thank you so much, Steve. Uh, Vikas and Steve, actually, I have this question for you now before we move on to, uh, you know, how this is going to play out. So India recently adopted the arbitrator immunity uh, provision in the, in the Arbitration Conciliation Act. And since Steve mentioned that parties and arbitrator tribunals are ignoring the GDPR at this point, do you think that at, at some stage later on, it can become a question of arbitrator liability if data protection laws are ignored in arbitration? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll let Steve answer that one and I'll probably chime in with the Indian perspective. Steve. Uh, okay, uh, I, I'm happy to go first if, if you want me to. Uh, I, think, I think it is, a lot of this is tied up with arbitrators, risk, um, and, and while it's mostly being ignored, to the extent it's being paid attention to, it's by, by risk-averse arbitrators who are starting to say, I face some potential real exposure here, and this may be something that is also beyond the normal immunity for, you know, if I act incompetently in an arbitration because this is a government regulation that, and so therefore I want to take steps to take care of it. So I think that's what, where it is addressed, I think it's driven by that concern as well as occasionally by overly cautious parties who want to make sure that they're not exposed, maybe companies that are used to having to do a lot of compliance and, and, and are audited a lot for compliance um, are starting to say, well, we need to make sure this stuff is addressed in, in arbitrations. I don't think it's the dispute resolution lawyers who are driving this, but it will be the arbitrators who will drive this because of fear over their own exposure and, and whether the general kinds of immunities we see what will protect them from breach of these sorts of uh, government regulations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think uh, there's a couple of, uh, I completely agree with Steve, and I think there's a couple of reasons why that, that's the case, because maybe you have immunity. Let's say you have an Indian arbitrator sitting in an Indian arbitration governed by the Indian Arbitration Conciliation Act. They may try and seek immunity under the Indian Arbitration Conciliation Act. But let's say the GDPR was to apply to them. Now, there is no one in the EU courts who are going to say that your immunity under an Indian arbitration legislation is somehow going to safeguard you from a GDPR violation. If otherwise that classifies as a, a very typical GDPR violation, let's say, for instance, the arbitrator let all of the personal information of, you know, very, very sensitive data, which was given to him, just let loose into the public. Now that will not, at least in my view, I think, come to the aid of the arbitral tribunal and say, protect him against extraterritorial application of a number of legislations, and particularly in the uh, data protection space, almost all of the legislations seem to have that, you know, extraterritorial effect. Another thing I'll also mention here, since you mentioned with sort of immunity is the arbitral institutions bit of things. And I'm sure, and I know you alluded to that. So you probably come down to it a little bit later is not only the arbitrators. And I think this is something that's going to start becoming a bigger concern for arbitration institutions. Because if let's say an arbitrator is dealing with four cases, an institution is probably dealing with 400. And therefore, the magnitude of impact, the magnitude of any uh, potential breach is significantly higher there. So while maybe arbitrators can try and wriggle out with some immunity provisions, I don't think the institutions will enjoy quite as much protection ever. Thank you, uh, Vikas and Steve. Shivam, uh, actually, I, my tied up question to that is for you, is that arbitrator immunity is not granted in India. It still is on a very good faith negligence. We are not exactly we're not exactly clear what that standard is going to be. How do you feel that the courts might might look at the question of arbitrator immunity, especially in the context of data protection with the new incorporation? Well, I think uh, thanks, Ajay. Uh, thanks for the question, and uh, uh, I think to respond to that, uh, Indian courts at the present, if something of this nature were to come before them, they would be extremely, I would say, tied in terms of proceeding against the arbitrator, because uh, unlike a lot of other jurisdictions which have a greater emphasis on institutional arbitration. A lot of Indian arbitration, for better or worse, is ad hoc arbitration. And a lot of this ad hoc arbitration is populated by retired judges. So there is a feeling of brotherhood, of camaraderie, and there is a feeling of going against their own uh, peers in this regard. So even, 
until and unless there is an absolutely egregious violation which has taken place and there has been a wide scale leak of some sort which is absolutely shocking, I do not think that the Indian courts at this point in time are A, equipped to deal with this, B, even if they are equipped to deal with it, they are not, they are not too keen to deal with this because they realize that at the end of the day, when you start pointing fingers for these data breaches, then you're effectively creating, creating a bit of a crevice in this very, very closely knit, retired judge arbitration setup. So I do not think that the Indian courts at this point in time would want to take the initiative of dealing with it. However, if they do decide to take the initiative in this, under the Indian Arbitration Act, they could take recourse to Section 14, of which deals with termination of mandate. They can say that this is termination of mandate of the arbitrator because the violation is so egregious that they, they have, by, by the force of law, by de, jure, by de jure actions, they have not performed their duty and therefore their mandate should be terminated. But I do not foresee that happening anytime soon. I would be, I'd be surprised if it were to happen. Right. Thank you, Shivam. I'll now move on to uh, the more specific questions that, that we want to address. One that is the most pertaining, uh, pertinent one, and especially what Steve said, anything and anyone that touches the data protection law has to comply with it. Right. So the question is, which law is that? How do you determine applicable law in terms of data protection? And if it's GDPR, can you then take refuge under the exemption of compliance with a legal obligation or legitimate interest and therefore excuse uh, compliance with data protection. The second question tied to that question is, if I've consented to the arbitration agreement, can my consent be taken to data protection law as well, even though explicit consent is required? And how do you seek that consent? Is it notice? Is it specific consent forms? So how do you determine the law and then what does that law need to really contain? So um, maybe I think we can start in turns because I've touched on the GDPR. Steve, maybe I think you can go first and then we can rotate amongst us. So uh, yeah, to emphasize what you said, it, it, it is anyone who touches the arbitration and it's the data that's protected, not the parties. And so while this is not tested, in any proceedings, so we don't have court guidance on this. Um, I think the most obvious reading of the regulations say that if there is uh, data that's European data or, your, or data that touches Europe, it becomes protected um, by the GDPR, regardless of where you're sitting, regardless of where the parties are. And that creates an if, a real difficulty. You can't really contract out of that. I mean, we could all agree that we don't want the GDPR to apply, but if, if the regulator decides there was European data there, it's not about what we agree, it's about protecting the, the data of the European citizens who have, or, or the, the, the data from Europe that's touched the arbitration. So there's a real limited ability to contract out of, of um, data protection acts, whether it's the GDPR or ones from other countries. And it is in some ways, it exposes one of the issues in international arbitration, which is we all tend to make assumptions about what procedural law applies. We don't tend often to contract expressly to say what procedural law applies. What the GDPR and other data protection acts are is they're not even procedural laws. They're, just man they're often just mandatory laws that apply that you can't deal with. So I think that what that drives to is a, trying to be aware of what carve-outs there are within those sorts of acts to make sure that you're jointly characterizing what you're doing as something that fits the carve-outs. And different data protection acts have more or less carve-outs for litigation and dispute resolution. And, and B, tr probably trying to take some steps to say we're paying attention in a way that's global, you know, in a way that's reasonable so that a regulator anywhere even if you don't want it to apply, we'll say, okay, we're going to give you some um, leeway because you, you identified this issue. Um, but consent becomes 
difficult because I don't think anyone will say that consent can come from the general act of arbitration. Maybe if we shift arbitration rules to include something like that, it would start to move in that direction. But a lot of the regulations like the GDPR make consent revocable. So it only gets you a certain uh, bit of protection. And you know, I was thinking about this in light of, as I said, confidentiality and other issues. You know, one of the issues in, in international arbitration that comes up um, a lot that we also brush aside is the question of how do you apply legal privilege concepts when you've got uh, parties and lawyers coming from different jurisdictions. And we've come up with a whole bunch of practical solutions that usually I, I don't think are particularly um, theoretically compelling, but work in practice. Like we'll take the, we'll apply the most strict rule to everybody, even if it doesn't apply to them in their home jurisdiction, or we'll apply the most liberal rule to everyone. You can't do that with a data protection act if it's mandatory law. And you may have multiple regulators who take a different view. And so it, it is a very difficult issue. And I think the best approach ultimately becomes trying to be, to take some proactive steps to be reasonable about it. And, and, and I'm gonna stop there with an, a digression that I meant to made, make earlier, because I think it is important to understand the scope of this. It's not just what happens in the arbitration between the parties and the tribunal. You, in building your case, and trying to get evidence from your own from your own side may will very likely be implicating a data protection issue. Um, be, so if you reach out, if you have a company, you ask them you ask them to look through their email files to help you put your case together. You know that's got data protection issues, and so it's not so it's not just what you do with the other side and with the arbitrators. It's what you do, um, and if your company has locations in different parts of the world, you have to deal with. Um, potentially what the data protection regulations are in all those different places where you're, you're seeking data to help your, you know, to help build your own case. All right. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, Vikas, would you take on from there? If data protection law is mandatory law, uh, are there participants in the arbitral tribunal, data controllers, joint controllers, what do you see happening, especially, I mean, you, you set up the ODR platform, I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of this, this kind of trouble, or at least you must have anticipated a lot of this that might be, uh, you know, con related to online dispute resolution. Why don't you tell us what you think as to the law applicable and what solution you can find for it? So uh, I, I think, Ajay, I think, let me just absolutely agree with what Steve said, which is, I think it is mandatory law. I don't think you can opt out of it. And I think in that sense, is the, the closest analogy I can think of is probably your bribery act or FCPA type things where it doesn't matter what you say in your agreement. If whatever the act is falls within the ambit of those very extra territorial jurisdiction, they will apply irrespective of what the parties have chosen. Having said that, I think there's a couple of uh, kinds of e exemptions. And I, obviously you look at each one in turn to figure out what the exemption is. But let me quickly see what the Information Technology Act says. For instance, the, the rules that I was talking about, rule six of that specifically says that while disclosure of sensitive personal data or information to any third party shall require prior permission, it shall not be necessary where disclosure is necessary for compliance of a legal obligation. Or if you're going into, for example, the PDP bill itself, it goes a little bit further than that. And it says that when you are using the, uh, sorry, let me just quickly read it up. Section 36 says, Disclosure of personal data is necessary for enforcing any legal right or claim seeking any relief, etc. So, you know, in the specific context where you might have a third party information, which might be personal information. In most cases, your legislations will permit you to use that information if that is necessary for taking legal recourse. So I think the consent paradigm that would traditionally apply most legal systems would have made some sort of an exception to that. So I think that is that is sort of one aspect which you also need to think about when you're looking at data protection. That is from the point of view of a person, let's say I'm the claimant, I have certain third party information, but I want to initiate a, an arbitration where maybe the details of that particular person needs to be disclosed. Am I required to obtain the consent from that third person? And I think about, let's say an infrastructure contract, for instance, you are talking about thousands and millions of people. Like, let's say if I want to give a labor record, I just want to say, you know, which of these people were attending, uh, attending site on a day to day basis, that record is likely to have very sensitive information. They may have their names. It might, it'll have certainly the location they were at that particular point in time. It may have some greater details about them also. So in that context, I think we'll have to start looking at it in the prism of 
it is enforcement of a legal obligation. Now let's move further down in the value chain. Once that information has come on and it is now with institutions, it is with arbitrators. How does that apply? You're absolutely right. The definitions, you know, whether it is under the GDPR, whether it is under the proposed PDP bill, institutions and arbitrators will start falling within either a data fiduciary or a data processor, depending on exactly the role they're playing and depending on what the legislation that, that you're governing is. But most certainly, because they have access to that particular information, they certainly will have some amount of obligations on them. And in that context, uh, and like you said, we started CODR, the Center for Online Dispute Resolution, where we expect to receive a lot of this kind of information. And what we saw was we will be ahead of the curve. If you look at traditional institutions, arbitration institutions, they almost have no data protection policies. I mean, think about it, right? A couple of instances. One, the PC. There was a cyber attack on the permanent court of arbitration servers not too long ago in the middle of an arbitration when a number of you know, systems were compromised and there was a risk that you know there was data theft that was happening. That was one instance, but that if you multiply it with the number of arbitration institutions across the world can happen anywhere. And these arbitration institutions, particularly the more well-known ones are processing information of disputes in the billions of dollars. So you have some extremely sensitive information. You're talking about shareholders disputes, for example, you have market sensitive price sensitive information that is already there. But if you look at the data protection systems, they, I mean, maybe they use a firewall or maybe they don't, maybe they use some sort of an antivirus thing, but it's all very internal. They've not really been mandated by anything to try and use that. And that's the context in which increasingly institutions will need to move towards embracing some sort of protocol. And I think Steve mentioned protocols. There's a, a New York protocol that came about earlier this year, which talks about the cybersecurity protocols for a number of actors involved in it. What we as an institution are trying to do is trying to take as much of the protocol on board as possible, recognizing that we are in a new world where we can't say, assume that the GDPR doesn't apply to us, but try and actively anticipate that in the future it will and start designing systems that will comply with that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Shivam, uh, tied to what Steve has said and what Vikas has said, I think both of us can anticipate a lot of section 34 applications were setting aside the award. Uh, on on a public policy violation of not adhering to data protection standards in India, uh, it, because that's that's where it'll ultimately hit, right? So, what what is your take on the compliance with mandatory law, Section Thirty Four, setting aside applications and compliance with data protection? Just to just to answer your question, uh, Jar, yes, uh, it's quite possible that lawyers will be innovative in the Indian context and they will use this as an argument to say that uh, my fundamental right to privacy has been breached as it been created by the Supreme Court in 2017 for the Swami and they'll say that this is such an important right which is conferred upon me and its breach has violated the entire sanctity of the award that they will seek to move section 34. However, I think that is an argument which they will make only for the argument to be rejected. This is, an, this is not something which I anticipate the courts accepting. One, because as I indicated, fortunately or unfortunately, all arbitral awards in India, or not all, but a majority of them are rendered by retired judges. I do not see a, a 34 by a high court judge rendering another brother judge's award to be null and void, especially on this basis. I do not see that happening. That is one. Second, even if they were to apply the Puttaswami standard, which is of the right to privacy, they will then move to the idea and they will take this forward in terms of whether this breach of law has been a de facto breach or it has been a de jure breach. It can be said that any any leak of data is definitely a breach in law but the courts will then move on to examine whether this breach of law has resulted in grave and irreparable prejudice being caused to the person in question and if the if the person who's anticipating or lodging this challenge cannot establish that this data breach has in fact caused grave and irreparable prejudice then i actually feel that people who lodge these challenges will not only face rejections, but they'll also face costs by the Indian courts. 
Thank you, uh, Shivam. Vikas, just to just to tie in from that point, Shivam made. Do you think that data protection can be considered against the fundamental policy of India, the the standard that has now been set? I mean, I I, I don't think so, and I and I agree with Shivam. I think both from a practical standpoint and a legal standpoint. While uh, unless you see that that data breach has actually impacted the arbitral process. And I think that can happen in some instances. Let's say, for instance, you're talking about arbitral records themselves having been tampered as a result of a data breach, or at least there being a question mark on whether an arbitral record has been tampered as a result of a data breach. There, I might say there is some scope for intervention. There is some legitimate scope for intervention, if I may add. But I think barring that, I would be extremely surprised if the courts use the fundamental policy of India as or the public policy exception to interfere with these arbitral awards. And certainly as a matter of practice, I mean, if you look at it from a very uh, grassroots perspective, if you see how arbitrators today operate, right? They have some person literally carrying their files. They have absolutely no idea where the files are, where they're getting stored, etc. So they're not they're not even thinking about it. And to add to what Shivam was saying, it's not only that their brother judges are there, it is their future selves. They're looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, that is me five years down the line. Will someone sanction me for this? Am I going to lay the path for someone sanctioning me for this conduct? I'd be extremely surprised if someone actually did that. Fair enough. I, I can only say that I pretty well agree with the two of you. And Steve, I, I don't know if you'd find that a bit surprising in the Indian context, that judges would actually not... Uh, sanction conduct simply because they see themselves as being future judges or future arbitrators there. I don't know if that's something that happens uh, internationally as much as it happens in India. And that, uh, that brings me to my is... or, Yes? No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no please, please. You, I, I was just moving to the second question. You can, you can close this and then we can move. No, I was just going to say, I think this idea that arbitrators are reluctant sanction conduct is universal. All right, that, that, let's move to the second issue based on uh, the proverbial thing that Vikas said, literally carrying the files, right? Who is supposed to lead the cybersecurity data protocol? I mean, Steve mentioned it, you mentioned it. There's an ICC protocol out there which talks about what you need to do. It also lists out a procedural order. So do tribunals now take the baton and say, we are going to tell you what the protocol is. Do parties need to agree, it, agree to it in advance? Can you raise a procedural objection with the protocol itself? Who, who ensures the compliance with the protocol and who takes the lead? Uh, Steve or Vikas, either one of you can just take that and go first. Steve, would you want to do that? I'm happy to go first if that's okay. I'm having some sound problems, but um, if you can hear me, I'll go first. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this is a tricky question um, for two, di two different reasons. One is it, it requires someone, until we have institutional rules that say this is obligatory as part of the procedure, it requires someone to, to raise it. And for the reasons we were already talking about, people don't like this issue, um, data protection or cybersecurity. Um, often the people who are the most vulnerable are the arbitrators and therefore they're least likely to recognize their own vulnerability. Um, in the cases I've been involved in where people have aggressively raised it, it's been one of the, one of the law firms involved in, in the case um, who have raised it. And usually where there was um, IP or other um, information involved that they were concerned uh, not just proprietary information, but information that they were so felt was so sensitive that they wanted to try to make sure there were there were protections and to enhance whatever confidentiality obligations there were by drawing particular attention to cybersecurity risks. Um, so that's how I've seen it happen. Um, I actually think everyone should be thinking about it, and the, it, it is easier often for the arbitrators or the institution to raise it because then people come in on a level playing field. As soon as, it, as one side comes in proposing a protocol, you know, that creates often, you know, a, a combative situation where the other sides think, well, what are you doing and why are you doing this? And what can I, you know, how do I want to negotiate this? So if it does come from the tribunal 
or from the institution, it, it may, it sometimes is easier to, to reach some sort of agreement. So I mean, maybe I stop there. I, I think everyone should be thinking about it. The difficulty is what is it? And we'll come on to that, I think, later on. But what is it, this thing that we're going to do about cybersecurity? But raising it early, I think, should best, best comes from the tribunal if, if it happens that way. I'll, in fact, uh, you know, take, take it a step back. I'd say for exactly the reason Steve mentioned, which is the tribunal's reluctance. And the tribunal's reluctance, you can imagine, is well-founded because they will then also have to comply with everything that they're asking the parties to comply with. And not all tribunals are actually equipped to deal with them. So I would say, in fact, the, the lead should come from the arbitration institutions where they can, where if they are able to start saying that as a matter of requirement, you know, if to, to comply with the arbitral rules, you need to start implementing certain cybersecurity protocols and processes. That is probably where in practice things can actually start happening. While of course an arbitral tribunal doing it is good and ideal because you can then tailor it and curate it to the specific needs and requirements of a particular dispute. In practice, that might become hard to implement. But having said that, I think institutions will also be wary because they do not want to put out a protocol which in practice is difficult or impossible for the parties to comply with. And just given the wide range of disputes the institutions handle, the wide geographies that they're involved in, they don't want to maybe come across as, uh, you know, maybe foreclosing legal recourse for some or all of the parties to an arbitration, which is a legitimate risk if you start imposing technological barriers, which might make it difficult, if not impossible, for people with limited resources to actually access them. So I think while institution is the correct place, in my view, to start this process, they need to be mindful of practical realities and seeing if it is reasonable and workable in a circumstance. Oh, okay, uh, Shivam, do you think that either the arbitrator or the arbitral institute, as Vikas puts it, are equipped to deal with these things? Because, you know, let's say we have a protocol the arbitrators come out with something, the institutes come out with something, and then you have practical issues of testing, who's going to comply, whether certain computer requirements are fulfilled. Do you think parties will be able to comply with that protocol? And if they cannot comply with that protocol, what is the effect that's going to happen? Are we looking at a potentially uh, a potential award which can be challenged? Are we looking at a mere procedural irregularity? Are we looking at costs? What are we looking at? Thanks for the question, Ajar. I think uh, if you respond to that, I would say that in this particular situation, what would happen is that if parties were to begin challenging this or parties were to begin uh, indicating that uh, these, are, these are onerous obligations and they cannot fulfill it, then what the arbitrators will do is that they will seek uniform consent from everyone. They'll, see, they'll ask the parties and say that, look, we believe that this is an obligation which needs to be fulfilled. Are you willing to waive it? I believe that most parties, unless they are absolute sticklers for rules, or if they feel that this is something which is integral to their data, would be more than willing to waive these objections. That is my first view. The second is that if it, it, if, if it is in fact challenged in courts, then what do we anticipate that to be the mechanism? I do not think that that is something which is going to result in positive in positive i think we've lost shivam is, is that yeah i i think we have maybe we, you he can resume once he reconnects yeah. maybe I, can... I, I just i just ask uh, uh steve uh, to finish that up uh, steve do you think that um, this can lead to a challenge later on if or can can the tribunals give such onerous requirements if people don't have the kind of technological setup to actually comply with the protocols? I'm sorry, I, got I only got part of the question. Can it lead to a challenge if the tribe? Shivam, uh, I was just asking Steve to, to take from where you left, whether you think tribunals or institutes enforcing a protocol would then become an onerous thing for parties and would it then violate the arbitration agreement or the law agreement yeah. for parties? So, so 
I, I got bits and pieces of that. So if, if I understood it, the question is, if the parties agree and the tribunal doesn't accept and put a protocol in place that the parties have agreed, could that lead to a challenge? Yeah. I, th I think it could. It's a complicated question. What are you challenging? I mean, if we say that the tribunal has an obligation to um, impo impose things agreed between the parties, are we challenging? Yeah, I think you, it's a good question. I think the answer is yes, it could, although it would, it would depend a lot on the particular circumstances, particularly what the result of the challenge would be. Would you disqualify the tribunal for failing to um, implement something that the parties had agreed? Um, I, I, I could see a scenario in which you could. I would expect that it may matter whether there was actual negative consequences from failing to do so rather than a theoretical problem. But that maybe that's wrong. I'd be curious as to what other people think about that. All right, uh, Shivam, do you want to wrap up uh, your point because you, you've been cut off in the middle? Yeah, I was just uh, indicating that in terms of challenges which are lodged in this, I do not think that these challenges are going to be successful at least to begin with. Because uh, these uh, one, courts will apply the doctrine of waiver. They'll say that if this was waived by both parties, then we do not see any reason to interfere in it. Secondly, they'll say that if this was not waived, what is the irreversible error or what is the irreversible grave prejudice that has been caused to the affected party? If the party is unable to establish that, then it's something which I do not think will work in their favor. Yeah, that'll be my answer. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Just something that hit me uh, while we were discussing this. What if there is a party which, which is not as good with finances and then you impose a technological obligation? Uh, either either one of you could would you could you think of a scenario where one party would say look i cannot follow this protocol i don't have the money i want some costs to be paid in order to comply with this do you do you envisage or foresee something like that happening yeah Ajar, you know, when I was talking about access issues and when an institution is trying to impose a protocol it needs to start thinking about these lines, this is exactly the concern I had in mind, which is one of the parties will simply say, I don't have the means to do it. Now, I don't know if uh, an imposition of a costs would, would necessarily be attracted in those cases, because I can't see a typical example of existing interim relief, which can easily be used for this purpose, because no one can be allowed to fund my counterparty's litigation. I mean, forget my own litigation, there are some question marks on that, but I don't think a tribunal will order the claimant or, or the respondent to fund the claimant's litigation. I don't expect that to happen at all. And I don't think that'll be legally permissible. It will be a challenge, but I think it'll be a challenge that will be dealt with in much the same way as, you know, the argument that people take to say, I don't want to do arbitration because I don't have the money to pay the institution's fees or the arbitrator's fee. And therefore my access to justice is affected. I think there's been a couple of instances in the United States where this argument was taken. And in one instance, the court said, absolutely nothing doing it's uh, you've agreed to arbitration. So you live with it, even if that has financial implication. But in another case, I think the court was lenient and that said, this amounts to a denial of justice. And as a ultimate custodian of law, I cannot let a party suffer that. So it is possible that, you know, may, maybe the Supreme Court will, will say that this cannot be done. And if that person genuinely does not have the money, then I will take it upon myself to resolve that dispute. But it's a very, very complicated question. Okay, uh, Steve, do you think uh, do you think it's an Article 16 challenge in the making? Fair and equitable treatment you impose on onerous restrictions or compliance issues? I, I think it takes an extreme case. I think, you know, one of the questions is when we start talking about cybersecurity and other measures, they're supposed to be reasonable and proportionate and therefore should take into account the party's, the party's resources. Um, seeing it as a, so I'm, I'm trying to imagine a scenario in which it is a case that someone has been so unequally treated because of a reasonable and proportionate uh, measure that it can lead to an Article 16 challenge. I think it takes some extreme facts, but it's, 
know, extreme facts happen sometimes. Uh, I mean, one of the issues here is we haven't really talked about the content of what most cybersecurity protocols and measures require. They don't have to be expensive, but it's also we're, uh, jumping ahead slightly where institutions um, can step in where it's where it's institutional arbitration and, and, and also try to moderate some of the some of the costs. All right, that that takes me to the to the next leg, and I, I see we have just an hour done, so we have about thirty minutes left. Uh, Steve, would you like to lead with? You wanted to discuss the security protocols, and that also uh, tied to that question. I'd like you to answer: How will a breach be measured if you if those protocols are adopted? So it's it's entirely your floor on how you want to discuss those protocols now. Sure. Uh, there are there are a number of protocols that are available out there, and I think it's worth looking at. And I think the, the best and most comprehensive is the recent ICA, ICCA um, protocol, and I think it does a good job of explaining the issues. It is, in the end, though, somewhat vague, because what it does is say you've got to take into account the parties, the case, the, the type of data that's in the case, and try to come up with, a, as I said, a reasonable and proportionate framework to regulate um, the, the security of, of data. And so in some ways it functions more as an educational, you know, uh, has an educational purpose to really alert people to the variety of risks and the variety of options they have. And there are, but there are a number of other protocols out there. The, mostly what they try to do is to put people on notice that there's an issue to require people to represent. And by people, I mean the, the, the participants in the arbitration, the parties, the party representatives, the tribunal, the institution, if there's an institution, to, 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 to require them to represent their taking steps to, to keep data secure and confidential and to provide notice to the other parties if they have any reason to suspect there's been a breach of, of data. And what they don't do is say what the nature of those obligations are and what enforceability or consequences there is if someone fails to comply with those obligations to try to keep things secure and to, no and to notify people when there is a, is a suspicion of a breach. And that's the big untested area. And frankly, in most cases, if someone tries to create, I, well, two things. One is, in the cases I've been involved in, often when one side proposes that, the other side has a natural reaction to saying, well, what is the consequence? What, are you, what am I committing myself to? I, I want there to be cybersecurity as well, but I don't understand from the way this is written what's going to happen if you or I feel like you know, we've want, the other side has breached it. And that's sort of the great unknown. And, and, and you know, have a very difficult negotiation because it's usually outside of the existing contract, right? So you have a difficult negotiation if you want to add teeth to this, these obligations to say, is this now a contractual commitment? Is it a contractual commitment within the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal? Why do the arbitrators want to commit themselves to liability potentially for, their, for themselves? So there is a real question about what do these protocols do in the end other than to try to get people to pay attention to this issue? And then your question about measuring, it is, I think, a super complicated issue. And it's always been the case with confidentiality breaches that it's been a difficult issue because there are parties who often abuse confidentiality before we got to cybersecurity, knowing that it was very difficult for the other side to do anything about it. You know, how, how do you prove damages because someone has leaked information about uh, something that was about the arbitration or about something that's been disclosed in the arbitration and cybersecurity breaches have the same problem and sometimes worse because if it's merely a concern that there's been a breach you don't even know for sure. There's been a breach. Who's managed to access that data? Some hacker from, from U Ukraine has access to your data, you think, but you don't know what they're going to do with it and when. Being able to show you've been harmed is very difficult. And then the question is, who has the, uh, who has the authority to, to um, do anything about it? Is this within the authority of the tribunal or is it a, a tort that's separately arisen and needs to be... Uh, decided through a court? Is it a contract breach that's se separately arisen that needs to be regulated through a court? Is it a regulatory breach that a government reg reg regulator is going to deal with? So these are all why, why these protocols are more prophylactic than effective. And the question of measures is really difficult. And I think then the, the question becomes, should we be thinking about some form of sanctions that don't require you to prove your harm?
if we're really concerned about making these things effective? And that's a really difficult question and again raises authority issues. Do arbitrators have the ability to impose sanctions that are not damages and do they want to? You said at the beginning or we said at the beginning arbitrators are, hate policing conduct. This is particularly hard, but what, and what if it's the arbitrator himself or herself who did the, who was responsible for the breach? I don't have good answers for this. I am just flagging, flagging the issues, but these are the issues. And this is why these protocols are so vague because it's very difficult to get the things that everyone in the middle of a dispute are willing to agree to. Yeah, uh, but maybe yes. as a follow-up question to that, Stephen, if, if you could answer. I understand all the complications you're talking about when, let's say, an arbitral tribunal is at breach. But what if the other party is at breach? What is your set of using costs of arbitration as the head under which any potential damages can, I mean, assuming it can all be proven, it can be quantified, all of those hoops if you're able to cross. What's your sense? Can we put it under costs of an arbitral process? It's a good, it's a good point. I think the problem becomes... Yes, and I think arbitrators are much more willing to regulate bad conduct through cost awards than anything else. And so I think that is a vehicle that works sometimes. But frankly, if you're talking about an IP business and the, cyber the failure to have good cybersecurity in place means you have had data from the other side that's worth billions hacked by somebody, and it's your fault for having you know incompetent or uh, negligent data security, the cost shifting costs in the arbitration is going to do nothing to, to remedy that in any meaningful sense. So yes, in small and ordinary ways, cost is a very, is, is probably the best option, um, particularly if it's about conduct of the arbitration and people in the arbitration have agreed to be mindful of, uh, of cybersecurity, you've breached that obligation we're going to take that into account at the cost stage. I think that's comfortable for many arbitrators, um, but whether it comes close to satisfying the consequences of a, of a serious cybersecurity issue is another question. And again, fact specific, but I, it, you can easily imagine circumstances in which it does very little to, to give relief to the party who's, who's uh, suffered a loss of data because of that. Okay, Shivam, uh, I. I want to, I think you would be the best person to answer the question on damages and what requires to be proved when you talk about confidential breaches. Uh, you know, you've dealt with a lot of arbitrations, you've dealt with a lot of litigation cases. Uh, in your experience, how are, how are courts dealing with confidential, uh, confidentiality breaches and damages and, and how are tribunals dealing with, are they the same, are they different? What is the standard being applied and how are they being proved? Uh, thanks, Ajar. I think uh, this is an issue which has now become sort of live in the Indian context after the 2019 amendments. If you look at the 2019 amendments, Section 42A has been introduced. And Section 42A within the Indian Arbitration Act, or Arbitration and Conciliation Act, rather, speaks about the confidentiality issue. Now, all parts of it are confidential except the award portion. Now, there is very little clarity on how this confidentiality is to be maintained and whether this 42A applies for Section 9, such as interim measures, for Section 14, termination of mandate, etc. So court intervention is required at this stage to offer a certain bit of clarity in this regard. This is definitely a step which the Indian courts have, or the Indian judiciary has taken, but, or the, sorry, the Indian uh, legislature has taken, but judicial intervention is required to clarify the scope of this. At this particular point in time, these courts have not offered any real guidance on it. And courts have generally been extremely glacial in dealing with the issue as to how confidentiality breaches should go. Because the first thing which they ask you when you argue something of this nature or you indicate something of this nature is that which provision of law is violated. Till the 2019 amendment, this was not even a question which anybody was equipped to answer. After the 2019 amendments, there, this has become at least in the nature of a provision. However, the unfortunate part of it is that there is no penalty which is prescribed for violation of Section 42A. So it is at the moment more in the nature of an advisory 
or a directory provision as opposed to a mandatory provision. All right. Thank you, Shivam. Vikas, uh, do you see any, I mean, Steve obviously mentioned uh, an exception where the arbitrator is, is responsible for the breach. And I think that would go more to arbitrator immunity than damages. But do you see anything happening on damages and how they are to be proved? What is, is the intention relevant or is an accidental leak also going to be held at the same standard? Again, so you, you, you're asking me through darts in the air without a, without a dart board in the end. Absolutely no idea. Right? I, so I'll give you my, uh, my best guess on what might be the instance. I think what is likely to be the case, like Steve mentioned, it's a very hard jurisdiction, I mean, a jurisprudential question as to what framework of law would you classify this breach in and what is the remedy? At least for me, I think the most likely remedy will either be a cost regime or a tort regime because there's unlikely to be a contractual undertaking between the relevant actors or even if there is, it's unlikely to be as robust as you would want it to be. In that situation, if you're talking of a tort type of instance, uh, you will probably come up with principles of negligence. You'll probably come up with uh, principles of vicarious liability, things like that. Using the same principles, I don't think intentional wrongdoing will necessarily be the threshold that will need to be met. Uh, of course, if you have specific legislation which imposes that requirement of intention, then so be it. But I think generally, if you're looking at damages, you are probably looking at your standard tort law principle of damages, of negligence, of causation, etc. And Steve, would those uh, damages in tort law require a separate arbitration proceeding, a separate litigation in court, or you're going to deal with all under the same roof? I think there be, there's some data issues there. My sense of that is, especially if an arbitration institution is involved, or if the arbitrator is involved, it cannot be in the same proceedings. It will necessarily have to be in a related proceedings, maybe a court proceedings, because there's unlikely to be an arbitration agreement between you and the arbitrator or the arbitration institution. So my sense is it's likely to be the courts, but I, maybe if Steve has, has a different view on those. Steve, uh, did you get my question? I think he... Right. Steve, uh, just to double check, can you hear me? I think I think there's a bit of an issue there. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I think we move on, Ajay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think. Uh, anyways, I think I'm, I'm on my last leg of uh, what is the role the arbitral institutes should play? Should they offer training to arbitrators? Should they again impose appropriate levels of security? Should they offer platforms like I uh, like HKIAC or, or you've offered a platform because what, how do you mandate and how do you comply with, with uh, data security and confidentiality standards? Uh, Shivam, uh, Vikas, either one of you, whoever wants to take the question can go first and, and maybe we can wait for Steve to join in. Yeah, I can maybe give in my first sense. I think institutions will have a big role to play at, for two reasons. Firstly, because they can. And second, I think because they should. They can in the sense that they have the ability to maybe come up with a device which is compliant enough for the purposes of any protocol. And they can require parties to use that platform in compliance. So let's say I'll give you an example. If you have an arbitration and where documents are being uploaded, if the other party's documents are being uploaded, your cybersecurity protocols would require that you take care of them. You need to ensure that they're properly safeguarded. They're not, you know, the access is not given, uh, given away willy-nilly, etc. So what an institution can do is it can certainly create that platform which complies with these requirements and tell parties that, listen, you can access this platform. You have access to all of the data, but if you want to download it, which means you're taking it away from my control and giving it to your own self within your control, whether it be in hard copy, whether it be a soft copy download, you need to necessarily file in that form, which says that the minute you download it, you take over that control. So that way the institution is not making it technology inaccessible. So because everyone has access to the platform, but yet ensuring that protocol carries forward by imposing some amount of control when the party willingly and voluntarily takes that information into its control away from the control of anyone else involved in that particular arbitration. Ivan, your thoughts uh, on the issue? 
uh, should our tribunal uh, institutes play a more proactive role? I definitely think they should. And as Vikas said, they are also in a position where they can. Because if you see for institutions as opposed to ad hoc arbitrations, ad hoc arbitrations necessarily run on good faith, on personal, personal networks, etc. But in an institution, if you are seeing a situation where an arbitrator is adhering to all these best practices, then there can be a situation wherein they're considered for, bet, for higher stakes of arbitrations. They're considered, they're probably accredited in a manner which cements their credentials. And that would invoke greater confidence in the parties who are approaching these institutions that yes, this is an accredited arbitrator. This is an arbitrator who's recommended by the institution himself or itself for taking recourse or for adopting the best practices. So yes, it is definitely a step which the institution should take. And if they do formalize it, then it's going to result in the better performing arbitrators securing better qualities of arbitrations and delivering even better quality of awards. Thank you, Shivam. I think Steve's back. Steve, uh, do you agree that the HKIAC's approach uh, in offering or facilitating platforms is good? Uh, I know you have your thoughts on it. Maybe you can, you can tell us all what you think. Steve? You're on mute, Steve. Sorry, I'm having trouble. I was having trouble hearing. Can you repeat? I said you have your yeah, HKIAC approach of whether uh, institutes should uh, take the lead and offer platforms and secure, it, secure storage platforms, etc. Yeah, I I think institutions need to, and I I think institutions need to take the lead, particularly for arbitrators. I get concerned, and I know many institutions are concerned about their ability to do it well. Um, at one point, the ICC a number of years ago tried to offer a, a platform that was meant to be secure, where people would do all their filings through the ICC, and it was a disaster because they weren't really it's not what they know how to do. Um, at one point, Ixit had a, he was using a cloud-based system for parties to put in their documentation. And the idea was to take this away from the parties and the tribunal. They picked a cloud-based solution that apparently was the easiest to hack out there. And these are just, they're, they're mindful of their own weaknesses. Um, so we have to go in a direction where they offer something that works as a, as a starting point. And if parties want to use other means and make a deliberate choice to go other directions, but I do think they're nervous. The institutions I'm involved in are nervous because they're worried they don't know how to do it well. And it's not just a liability concern. They, they genuinely want to do it right if they're going to do it. And they're not sure they've got the resources. You know, they, they're not necessarily large and IT savvy, um, but they have to. We're in a world where they have to at least offer a baseline um, product that works and then let parties who decide that there's better ways to do it to opt out. All right, uh, thank you, Steve. I think that's, that's broadly what uh, we had in store for, for a brief overview of the problems with data security and confidentiality today in, in international arbitration. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions that Vignesh and Aman have uh, shortlisted. Uh, Vignesh, would you like to now uh, uh, take the floor and ask the questions to whoever you think should be the one asking them? And I think you filtered quite a bit of them anyway. So I, I, I will take your uh, leave and, and make you the, the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prasajar. So we have uh, we did get quite a few questions and uh, through the course of the session, we've managed to uh, uh, roughly shortlist quite a few of them. Uh, perhaps just a couple of the things that uh, we can just look at uh, if uh, 
so in light of the uh, one of the questions that's been posed is in light of the uh, uh, potential threats to confidentiality posed by third party funders to commercial arbitration can the data protection regime provide safeguards for a non funded party with respect to the detailed arbitration data be shared with the funder which the former which is uh, which which the former may be uh, unaware of do you get this question or should i restructure a little uh, better No, I think I mean the, the, the message is clear. The question is, if there's a third-party funder involved, the counterparty is unaware that there is a third-party funder. Then how does the whole data protection and privacy regime work? Right? I I don't know if there is a correct answer to this one. I, I'll just give you my sense. If your law permits third-party funding, then your counterparty should expect when it's entering into a transaction with you that there is a possibility of a third-party funder coming into force. What this requires, at a slightly you know, policy-based level, is third-party funders to be regulated, and for the regulation to also clearly specify that the third-party funders are under the same confidentiality obligations as the primary party. But if the law permits third-party funding, then unless the law prohibits information, I don't think data protection and confidentiality restrictions can prevent that from happening. That's my first two cents. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, so this was a question that particularly interested me because uh, uh, I personally thought uh, it's uh, given what's been happening recently. So as most of you might know, the Kerala government uh, in India has been uh, launched uh, its approach to uh, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, and they've managed to manage a lot of data and uh, deal with it in order to be able to uh, prevent uh, large-scale exacerbation of the crisis itself. However, there was recently a high court petition which was filed against the Kerala government, uh, stating that they'd been using a foreign firm in order to uh, house their data and store it and so on. So the question particularly relates to that. Given that this, uh, uh, the government of Kerala raised this argument in the high court that there isn't enough technology available in India to handle this big data, do you think the death of such a facility in India affects data privacy? Uh, perhaps Mr. Shivam would like to answer that question. Yeah, I'll go ahead with this. Uh, in fact, this is a case which came up not too long ago in uh, in Kerala High Court, and it was in fact being heard by a video conferencing. And uh, one of the most bizarre arguments which uh, the Kerala government state took in at this stage was that uh, the sharing of this uh, information of sensitive biometric information or sensitive health data does not qualify to be sensitive data. At which point in time? The judges were aghast, everyone was aghast, and uh, the judges effectively told them that, look, we do not agree with this proposition that you're advancing before us at all. Now, to answer it in the Indian context, after Puttaswamy's judgment, which is the nine judges' right to privacy judgment of 2017, there is absolutely no question that this is something which is constitute or which does constitute very sensitive information. The difficulty which the Kerala government was facing in this particular regard was that they said that the Indian system is ill-equipped to deal with it. And therefore, we are giving it to a foreign jurisdiction or a foreign, com uh, foreign company. The Kerala government said, or the, the Kerala High Court rather said, that, okay, even if we were to accept that to be your position, we are still not in a position to understand as to why did you choose to have these disputes, if they arise, being arbitrated or being resolved in a foreign jurisdiction. So the Kerala High Court came down extremely hard on the Kerala government in this particular regard. They said, one, we have serious doubts about your bona fides because you said that this was not even confidential information and this was not private information. Be that as it may, even if we were to accept that you've acted in good faith, the fact that you've chosen to make a foreign country the base of this jurisdiction challenge or the base of any possible challenge does not speak very highly about you and this, there's a complete lack of lack of understanding of the indian law at this point and third in this particular regard is that at a time where the indian where the indian experiment or the indian approach in kerala has been lauded for being the correct approach of containment this is definitely an oversight by the Kerala government and, and they've been caught napping in this regard. So that's definitely some place where there is scope for improvement. Yeah. 
thank you thank you so much sir uh, so i just had a quick follow up a couple of people have been asking as to uh, whether you know the name of the case or uh, or the citation by any chance or that uh, of this particular case so if you do perhaps you can just drop it on a chat box and i can know that know the participants meanwhile i'll just move on to the next question which is uh, how do we uh, which is perhaps the last question that we're dealing with here how do we go about locking consent in say an arbitral proceeding of all sorts when the right to withdraw consent itself is an essential component of various data protection laws uh steve would you like to uh, answer that well yeah it's it's tough because of the as as the question recognizes that withdraw the right to withdraw is is usually in the law uh, so the way to do it generally is to try to avoid using data in a way that requires consent or um, to use data that only requires consent by the parties to the arbitration itself and therefore the the their participation in the arbitration makes it hard for them to then turn around to try to withdraw the consent because they either would be interfering with the with the procedure you know, acting in bad faith or otherwise can be said to have waived any right to withdraw consent by by agreeing to arbitrate but i think that the best approach is also to try to agree that the data being used is not the sort of data that requires consent um, if you can and there's you know suggestions about how to do that under the gdpr and some of the commentary on that which i think is quite is quite thoughtful and practical I think with uh, three minutes left to conclude, I think uh, we've finished all the questions and have discussed most of what we set out to discuss. Uh, and uh, I think it's been a very fruitful discussion. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. I have a, I have a question, Vignesh. I yes, have a question to all my panelists. Uh, as the moderator, I've treated them with fair and equitable treatment. <laughs> and you're satisfied with the outcome of these proceedings. <laughs> Most certainly. Most certainly. You'll, you'll have to wait for the section 34, Roger. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Steve, Vikas, and Shivam. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you, Vignesh and Aman. Uh, it's, I think it's one of the areas where, like Steve said and Vikas said at the beginning, it's all a shot in the dark. But I think there have been some very concrete answers as to which law applies, what should be the liability, should that be a tort claim. Should institutions now start setting up bases to tackle these questions? And I, I'm very grateful to to each one of you for for being so candid about your opinions throughout this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you. Uh, we'd we'd also like to thank Mr. Finizio and all the speakers, Mr. Finizio, for connecting with us, being in a different time zone and persisting through all the connectivity issues, but still connecting with us and talking to all of us. And the other panelists, uh, our beloved alumni, uh, Mr. Shivam Singh, Mr. Vikas Mahendra, and Mr. Rajarab, for being a part of this webinar and also continuously supporting the NLS student body uh, through these years. We're extremely grateful to all of you. Uh, lastly, we'd like to thank uh, Locktripus for giving us this platform wherein we could connect with so many participants at one point in time. We'd like to thank the members of the ADR board and the Moot Court Society who helped us organize this, who helped us draft the concept note, helped us approach different panelists, and helped us essentially execute this webinar in itself. And lastly, we'd like to thank all, all the attendees for joining us. And we hope everyone remains safe, everyone takes care, and we hope to host you all soon again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vignesh, do we have your permission to leave? Please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out your time and uh, coming. Okay. Thank you, guys. Great we work. Great work. Soon, hopefully on campus properly. So. Yeah. No worries. All right. All right. Bye. All right. Okay. Bye bye.